He's got one foot in the frying pan and one in the pressure cooker. Believe me, as a bowler, I know that right about now, your bladder feels like an overstuffed vacuum cleaner bag, and your butt is kind of like an about-to-explode bratwurst. Hey, do you mind? I wasn't talking when you were bowling. Was I talking out loud? Welcome to Munson's at the Movies. My name is Kyle. I will once again be your host. I'm joined by the rest of the Munson's. I want to give them a wide berth. He's what is called a born loser. A real Munson. (laughs) And talk a little bit about what's going on in their worlds. James. Want to uh, wish everybody in the uh, frat world that uh, the majority of us come from a happy Founders Day. Um, and hopefully you're not all frozen to death with how terrible it is outside. Warren? Yeah, just cold. That's about it. Speaking of cold, uh, Case, C- colder than anyone. Winter Storm Yuri, as it's, as it's affectionately referred to down here, by the first name from everybody. I did not know it was Winter Storm Yuri until I had people asking me if I was prepared for Yuri. <laughs> and I was not because I didn't know the name. As I was in the middle of a really important work conference call, in front of my window drives by a pickup truck, followed by a kayak driving right down the middle of the road. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. All right. So this is why we keep seeing videos of all those like 20 car pileups down by you. <laughs> <laughs> so some, uh, some locals in Texas there viewed the storm as a recreational opportunity. That's what I'm hearing. I'm sorry, you're referring to Yuri? Yeah, Yuri. I thought Yuri yeah, was just yeah. a Jehovah's Witness that you were expecting at your doorstep <laughs> any moment. But Mark. Same old, same old. I was thinking today that around this time of year, we'd be gearing up for the Oscars. But because of this crazy year, they're in April. Not much really on TV until we get to March Madness, unfortunately. So it's going to be a long, cold month. True. Well, in my world, I've got a big uh, job interview later this week, so I'm right. looking for some good vibes. You know, if you're listening, send the good vibes my way. Hopefully, that goes well. Hopefully, that'll bring greener pastures on my end. Yes, sir. Uh, Did you buy new uh, khakis? Did you, get, you get the khakis, <laughs> and then you get the jobs, and then you get the girls. <laughs> Everybody knows that. Uh, listen, steps one and two, I think I can manage getting the girls. That's way outside of my realm, Warren. Yeah. You should know better than that. Stick with Nintendo. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, big time things in the, the Munson's world. We recently hit our one year anniversary. So that's a year Ooh. of Munson's. That's pretty awesome. What better way to celebrate it than with the other half of the, the Rigby family and John Rigby making his return to the podcast. All um, right. Welcome let's... back, sir. Welcome back. Thanks for having me back. We crushed it the first time with Janny and ready to do it all over again. So if you didn't listen to the Janny episode, John Rigby lives in San Diego, California where he works as an attorney. He's a graduate of the UCLA School of Law and also a Phi Sci from the University of Iowa. He was previously a guest on Munson's at the Movies, as he just mentioned, where he joined us to discuss Allison Janney, who's still one of the higher-rated Munson actors that we've covered up to this point. We appreciate you being here, John. And uh, we look forward to our audience being confused as fuck as to who's talking which of the Rigby's. <laughs> Been that way for 30, 30, now 32 years. It was our birthday. 32 already. years as of yesterday. Woo. Yep, yep. Yeah, happy birthday, fellas. Happy Thank Valentine's you. Day. Happy birthday. All right, birthdays, February 25th. What we got, Warren? Man, we got a good little trio here. Rashida Jones. I love you, man. Parks and Rec, The Office, and Cop Out. <laughs> She's good. How old's Rashida Jones? 42. 44. 48. 39. Ooh. Going low. I'm going to go with 40, 42 as well. You got to guess 45. Guess. Doesn't matter. <laughs> 45. Didn't win. Yo, Rigby's, I think your whole family's going down. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we got Sean Astin, The Goonies, Lord of the Rings, Encino Man, 50 First Dates, and Rudy. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning Encino Man and shitting on Rudy. Appreciate you for that double whammy. <laughs> I want to give you a slow clap. He was offsides. Also dies a horrific <laughs> death in uh, Stranger Things. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. John Astin has looked 45 ever since, like, Encino Man. So, yeah, since so Rudy. <laughs> I feel like he's just, like, chronically has been old. He went from the Goonies to Encino Man, and he's been <laughs> Encino Man and just got a little bit fatter. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Sean Astin. 55. 58. 48. 52. 
I'm going to go with 47. Okay, good guess. <laughs> James wins with 48. It's, well, it's, it's 50. <laughs> and last but not least, Tia Leone. I was surprised. She's only been in like 13 movies, which feels really weird. Yeah, that's interesting. Bad Boys, awesome. Uh, Deep Impact, fun with Dick and Jane, and Tower Heist. So, <laughs> how old's Tia Leone? 55. 53, Warren. 48. I'll do 54. 51? All right, 55. Oh, I mean, I'm on 55. fire over here. Damn. Yeah, dude. Is that James again? Yeah. 45, 50, 55. That's Good it. Lord, James, settle down, sir. Your Googling skills are excellent. Yes, correct. Yeah, <laughs> Five actor choices on the wheel per usual. We lucked out. We did not have to watch uh, Kate Hudson's new movie, Music, which is getting abysmal reviews right now uh, because she was not selected. Neither was Michael Stolbarg kind of sad asif manvi or marissa tomei one of the podcast favorites she's awesome but that wheel did land on willie hurt i keep calling him willie hurt i've been calling him willie hurt for a week and a half now but william hurt it's billy billy hurt Billy. <laughs> okay we know we know him now. bill hurt nice to meet you yeah <laughs> i saw insurance bill hurt <laughs> it sounds like a used car salesman old billy's got 104 credits on his resume mostly film but he's he's dabbled in the tv world and he's done some theater work so we'll talk about quite a few of it as we dig into his career but before we do any of those things we always start with a little trivia from james to see if he can stump us rigby welcome back as you might remember we do two truths and a lie so i'm going to have two facts in here about good old billy hurt that are in fact true and one that is not true, but is actually a fact of one of the cast members of the Fast and the Furious franchise. You guys have to guess which one is which. Fact number one, he is the first actor ever to receive an Oscar nomination for their performance in a comic book adaptation. Fact number two, until he was six years old, he was incapable of forming intelligible sentences because he suffered from a neurological speech disorder called apraxia. Fact number three, he was once taken and held hostage during an off day while on location filming for a movie. I want to say that one is the lie. I feel like that's a really good question because I feel like History of Violence Thank you. was a graphic novel. So I think James is uh, trying to fool us with that one. So I'm going to go mm. I'm going to go number 2. This is tough. You're getting tricky. I feel pretty confident that 3 is true. I don't remember the movie he was on, but 1 and 2 is tricky. I'm I'm going to follow Rigby's approach. I'm going to say 2 is the lie as well. 2 is a lie. And I think it was actually DMX who played Davy in <laughs> Fast and the Furious Death Race. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the franchise, isn't oh, it? <laughs> you mean to tell me I've been missing out on potential DMX facts? I did not know he was in this universe. <laughs> no, he's not. Not yet. Okay. Okay, good. There's a different series that has <laughs> everything looks exactly the same. It is called Fast and the Furious. <laughs> That's awesome. Smart. The tagline in that movie is ride or die. Is it about family? <laughs> <laughs> I think number one is the uh, the lie. I'm going to go with one, too. I think that's actually, that's just straight up Vin Diesel. He got a, a, an award for Groot. Oh. <laughs> I think I know the answer, but I don't think it's that. <laughs> well, what is it? I think it was Al Pacino in Dick Tracy. Ooh. Yeah, but is he a Fast and Furious member? <laughs> uh, not yet. No, he's not. There's always time. So no one picked number three, which, to remind you all, is the absurd. He was once taken and held hostage during an off day while on location for a movie. And I can confirm that that is true. While making Kiss of a Spider Woman in Brazil, he had about 36 hours off from filming, went to a local village with some friends where they ended up being followed by four people in ski masks with automatic weapons, who held them hostage at gunpoint while they robbed a nearby house that they mistakenly thought Hurt and his friends lived in. Lovely. He sat there for hours while they completely cleaned the house out, and then they left him and the other hostages inside. And when they left, uh, they called the police, and those guys were caught the next day. But that was a banana story when I read that. The other one that you guys had guessed was fact number one. Um, and Rigby, uh, the other Rigby, I will give you credit that I intentionally worded that to confuse you, but you nailed it. The first actor to have receive an Oscar nomination for their performance in a comic adaptation would be Dick Tracy, but Dick Tracy was based on a comic strip. The first one to ever receive their performance for a comic book adaptation 
was, in fact, uh, William Hurt. Yes. He received a Best Supporting Actor nom for A History of Violence, which was originally a graphic novel published in 1997. The only others who have been nominated since are Heath Ledger and Joaquin Phoenix, both who won and both for their portrayals of the Joker. The guys who guessed fact number two, not being about William Hurt, you are correct. Yes. Until she was six years old, she was incapable of forming intelligible sentences because she had suffered from neurological speech disorder called apraxia. And that fact is actually about Ronda Rousey, the former UFC champion and star of Mile 22, The Expendables, and Furious 7. Mm. <laughs> Great work, James. That was a good, that was a good, well uh, done. good list there. When I read the kidnapping thing, I was like, how is this not discussed by everyone all the time? It's like yeah. him and Ryan Lochte in the Olympics like 10 years ago. <laughs> and like, that's the only people I know who's experienced that. Good work, James. Always refining your craft, my friend. And I try my best. We're just here to sit in awe. But also, how fucking badass would Al Pacino be in the Fast and Furious universe? That'd be sick. <laughs> you get him, get him to hop behind a car and hoo <laughs> <laughs> All right, Case, what do we got? Snapshot in box office history. Hurt has a very similar profile to our last episode, Angelica Houston. If you average up all the different ones, metrics I look at, he ranks 16th. Same thing, right, as Angelica Houston. Below average box office performance, and then pretty strong with critic and fan rankings. Of the 32 movies in the list I have, 15 of them have lost money. Damn. One of my favorite things to do is just to see anomalies. Noise, which I'm sure we will discuss later, (laughs) is quite the anomaly on the box office list. And I just just pay attention. I'm going to read 10 budgets, and I want you to tell me which one is noise. 15 million. 32 million, 50 million, 110, 20 million, 15 million, $2,416, 16 million, 40 million, and 150 million. Hmm. The 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 thousand dollar one. Yeah. 2416? It's got to be the thousand (laughs) dollar. The reason that jumped out of me in the first place is that it was in, I think it was in euros when it was listed on uh, IMDb. So I had to convert euros to dollars. On two different theaters on opening night, it pulled in $4,000. And it ended up making a total of $17,000 in the box office. The story and the production behind that movie are pretty fucking bananas. And I'm sure we'll talk about it later. So I'll, I'll save the discussion behind all that stuff later. But it did make me laugh that we have <laughs> we have a movie on our on our roster of movies uh, with a budget of $2,416. That's like a 700% <laughs> increase on the budget. I mean, yeah, dude, they made enough money to buy like a Chevy spark <laughs> <laughs> to lease, to lease it. To, <laughs> yeah, a pretty to lease, Honda really. Accord, bro. Mm-hmm. Appreciate it. Case. You bet. Before we get into film reviews, try to cover the early days of Willie hurt, Billy hurt. That would include his earliest days as the VP of the Dramatics Club at Middlesex Boarding School. So my man was getting into performing arts early on. He was the lead role in a number of school plays. In fact, even in his yearbook back in the day, if you pulled up his yearbook from his times at Middlesex Boarding School, you'd see a quote next to his name that says, you might see him on Broadway one day. And boy, they were uh, fairly accurate. I found out that another alum of the Middlesex Boarding School is Steve Carell. Ooh, look at that. Probably didn't cross at the same time. So no, they're about 10 yeah. years difference. Well, there you go. They weren't very clear on which Broadway. I mean, there's there's Broadway. Here <laughs> <and somebody>. there's... <laughs> they're like, we don't want to be too specific with our prediction. So we're just Yeah, I guess it's capital, capital B. So, yeah. He started his college work at Tufts, where he studied theology. And then eventually he made his way over to Juilliard. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. Kind of a small school. Online school? No, yeah, 100%. It's for profit. It is a part of the DeVry family, which is owned by the <laughs> University of Phoenix. Yes. The real artful side of DeVry. But he's, he was there in the late 60s. He was uh, classmates with guys like Christopher Reeve and Robin Williams. Studs. You know, some, some studs at the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Pre-Superman Reeve. I actually remember watching an interview with William Hurt about Robin Williams. Oh, yeah? I think it's an HBO documentary about kind of the, the brilliance of, of Robin William, and, and they talked about their time together at Juilliard. His earliest appearances on film and television, he had three early TV appearances on Kojak, The Best of Families, and Great Performances. 
through 77 to 78. In 77, he joined the Circle Repertory Company. He was a member there for 12 years, so doing a lot of stage work. Over that time, he got the Obie Award for his debut in My Life and received Theater World Awards for his performances in 5th of July, Attraction, and Lulu. I've never heard or seen any of those, but early in his theater days, it sounds like he was doing some decent work. Mm -hmm. Good for Billy at that point in time. I hope he never listens to this because we are just making fun of his name nonstop. But all that takes us to 1980 to his first feature film, or what we're calling his first feature film, and it is Altered States, and James is going to talk about it. Normally when I am assigned the first feature film, I'm expecting a movie to suck. That is because as a young actor, I'm just assuming you're going to take whatever role you can get. And Mm -hmm. it is very odd that he got a leading role in a big budget movie that is his first role and ended up being nominated for two Academy Awards and was pretty good. This movie was originally released in 1980. It's his first major role. It's nominated for two Academy Awards, Best Sound and Original Score. The plot summary, without you know spoiling it, is a genius scientist, a psychology professor uh, named Edward Jessup, who is played by Hurt, decides to combine his experiments in sensory deprivation tanks and hallucinogenic drugs, convinced that's going to help him kind of unlock a different altered state of con- consciousness, said the title. The experiments are a uh, success at first, but as he continues his work, he begins to experience kind of like a altered mental and also physical state, and he starts losing his grip on reality. Hurt is tremendous in this role, and I'm not shocked mm-hmm. that Hollywood was blown away by this breakout performance. He plays this eccentric, egotistical, and manic academic to perfection. You immediately understand why those characters who aren't in awe of his brilliance kind of hate him and those who believe he is on the verge of the next great scientific discovery can still barely tolerate him so like even his loved ones are like an arm's length away because he is so manic and so obsessed with his studies that it's hard to have a normal conversation with him aside from hertz fantastic performance what really sets this movie apart is how the quality of the special effects still manage to like inspire a genuine sense of awe after four decades of technology uh, advancing to the point where you can tell these special effects are done on a very basic level. Mm -hmm. And while some prosthetics don't look very good at all, they're only in the movie for like a short period of time. So I'll give them the benefit of the doubt when comparing to today's prosthetics. But the rest of the special effects still hold up. It's like this merging of imagery that's erotic and horrifying and psychedelic and it has a great score so i completely understand why it was nominated for academy awards with that the hallucinogenic experiences are shown to the audience multiple times and so when he trips you as the audience get to see what he's tripping and like experiencing and it's uh, scary and disorienting and if you like sci-fi horror movies then you should absolutely check this one out because it was a pleasant surprise to me the movie starts and sets the tone that it's going to be weird and it delivers on it and i was i was really impressed i think it's like you said it shows how good of an actor he really is to be to take that role and what it required like the intensity of it to do that for for a feature film debut i think shows why he was such a big actor in the 80s um and this was the start of it i think yeah i do remember the dream scene doesn't he have like um like animal heads on like he's like oh, nailed yeah. to a he's like nailed to a cross and stuff like that that's kind of what i remember it's just like really bizarre stuff i was looking up interviews with him about this movie and he's so thankful that he got to star in it because when he first read the script if you guys remember he studied theology mm-hmm. he thought that what the character was saying in regards to his beliefs in God and his disbeliefs in God are very similar to the issues that Hurt dealt with in an inner turmoil in studying religion, but also believing in science. And he's like, when I first read this script, I cried. I wanted the role so bad because it struck true to him on the ramblings that this character would have. And then when you watch this movie, Mm. it is someone who is, so deep into their own thoughts about what is real and what isn't real. And if he could speak to God, what would he say? That when you get to the dream sequences, 
you're like, I know this is going to be batshit banana land. It's going to be intense. And because it is not done with the kind of slapped together special effects of the 80s, like some movies where they're trying to put lasers in and they just don't have the tech for it. What they do is set pieces that hold up and models that hold up and cut scenes of films that are very disturbing, like you mentioned, like uh, him wearing an animal head and then him coming back to where he currently is and his body's made out of sand. And it's clear that they, someone sculpted what his body would look like made out of sand. And then maybe with just like a fan or something, they blew it away. But in this trippy experience, it still holds up and it's almost 40 years old. You're like, holy shit, this looks great. The last like 15 minutes of the movie, I think the story is good, but the special effects, that part doesn't hold up. Um, but it is absolutely worth watching. I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, it's worth watching if you like sci-fi and horror. If you don't, you'll hate this movie. Yeah. <laughs> but he does really well with it. And the rest of the cast does a great job playing off of his manic energy. And one of the cool things I read about this movie is it's also the film debut of Drew Barrymore. That's right. She plays his kid and she's like six, so she doesn't talk. But it's her first role. You know, it struck me that two things about his role in that. I agree 100% with his theology background. I think his really his strong stage background also helped him. I think a lot of the stage actors we've looked at, they make themselves the focus of the scene, right? And I think when he's in those manic states and he's trying to get all the other characters in the scene to focus on him, I think that his stage acting background came out. And the other thing, though, I've been to a sensory deprivation tank. And I didn't experience shit. (laughs) I feel like I got gypped. I think you're right with the stage performance part because you can see it in his monologues in that Mm -hmm. the emotion builds and builds and builds. But then the characters play off that really well. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, he marries the girl of his dreams, but not too long later, he wants to get a divorce. And everyone's like, why? And he, he goes off on this tangent about why would he waste time with someone that he's married to when he can try to find another plane of existence? Like, what's the point of being in love when other worlds exist? And you could just tell everyone's like, oh, Jesus, dude, shut the fuck up. Like, no one wants to hear about your drug-driven bullshit. (laughs) When he does have those hallucinations, you're like, okay, I kind of understand why he's being such a dick about it. His incessant ramblings about his hallucinations were driving everybody crazy, and it was great. Well, strong start right out of the gate for him. And I think to your point, James, you had mentioned he caught the eye of a lot of folks in Hollywood. And it's a testament to we're going to hit three back to back to back reviews because a year later, it's his highest critic score in 81 with Body Heat. And normally our guest Munson would take a separate movie out of the five categories, but we made a decision, kind of change things up a little bit and, and give our guest my review. And so I would have normally covered highest critic score, and I think John lucked out and got him a chance to talk Body Heat with us. Oh, yeah. Body Heat's fucking great, man. This is one of the best film noirs ever, in my opinion. Definitely one of the best of, you know, the sort of, post 40s and 50s sort of classic classic era and there's probably a reason for that the wikipedia page says it's influenced by but really it's just direct homage to the 1944 classic film noir double indemnities Mm, it's a good movie starring fred mcmurray and barbara stanwyck directed by billy wilder just a another movie like that about a man who a hapless kind of incompetent professional who meets a much younger woman and gets in way over his head to try to concoct a scheme to get her deadbeat husband out of the picture that's where william hurt comes in hurt plays a south florida lawyer named ned racine who tends to be a pretty shitty lawyer and as <laughs> as uh, as a lawyer myself hopefully i don't live up to the same to the <laughs> same circumstances that racine does he tends to represent pretty awful clients people who are trying to get the best of helpless citizens and people who kind of get in the, involved in in fraudulent schemes Racine has a penchant for committing ethical lapses, and as we see later on in the movie, professional malpractice, which would probably definitely get him disbarred and might and have him end up in prison. Body Heat takes place in, like I said, in, in South Florida in one of the hottest summers you can imagine. Every scene, the cinematography just screams it out. We have orange, red colors, and everything. The air, there's an air conditioning or a fan unit going on in the background of nearly every scene. Racine, after another sweaty day at the office, is 
walking around town and stumbles upon a beautiful young woman named Maddie Ross, played by Kathleen Turner in, I think, one of her first film roles. Body Heat was Kathleen Turner's first movie role. Mm -hmm. She was on The Doctors right before that, but that was her first movie, so good for her coming out of the gate. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. Like Stanwyck in Double Indemnity, Maddie is married to sort of a hapless town millionaire who seems to be always away on business. He's always gone. He's, you know, basically obviously providing a home and shelter for her, but she pretty much has a loveless marriage to him. That person is played by Richard Crenna. And obviously within the first uh, couple times of Racine and Maddie Ross meeting, a steamy affair starts. Like Fred McMurray's Walter Neff in Double Indemnity, we see Racine try to use his profession and his professional skills, or really lack thereof, as a lawyer, <laughs> as a way to kind of figure out a scheme to get the husband out of the picture forever and to ultimately be with, be with Maddie for good. Also, like Neff, uh, we see his, his groin do more thinking than his brain, and it kind of gets him, gets him in trouble. <laughs> the other treat of this movie, in addition to all the different twists and turns that the plot takes, are the supporting actors, supporting parts. Ted Danson plays a deputy prosecutor who has to go on the other side of of Racine. He's really charming. It's one of his first roles. Honestly, the best part of this movie, aside from being a direct homage to Double Indemnity, which is one of my favorite movies, uh, the screenplay is amazing. It was written and directed in his directorial debut by uh, Lawrence Kasdan. This is his streak of movies between 1980 and 1981 that he wrote screenplays for. The Empire Strikes Back, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Body Heat, and then in 1983, Return of the Jedi, and The Big Chill, which we'll talk about later. Holy shit. Yeah. Within three years, he wrote those those five movies. Did he also write Billy Madison later? <laughs> I think he actually, uh, uncredited, uh, him, and, uh, him and Robert Town also contributed <laughs> to that. As a, they had to clean up the mess and didn't get a credit for it. I love this movie. I recommend it to, to anyone, who, especially if you like crime noirs or film noirs. It's fantastic. This may be a dumb question, but why does it matter how hot it is? <laughs> Was it just something to like to give them something to talk about in the in, in like the script? I mean, there's so many times where he's like, "Oh, don't say anything about the heat," and then it's like, ha, 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 ha. like they just kind of like laugh at it. There's the opening scene in the diner when the waitress is like, "The heat makes people do crazy things." Yeah, and I think that's. Yeah kind of setting up what what's going to happen that's a good question i i know ebert in ebert did sort of like a reassessment of this thing or like a retroactive review and he talks about how the way the film evokes heat in particular body heat and like the way that people are always sweating and complaining about it kind of inflames passion and encourages people to do really dumb things when they aren't thinking very clearly which killing your mistress's husband is probably top of that list yep Mm -hmm. cool well that's body heat before we jump into the, the next review, William Hurt has a phenomenal decade, as we'll talk about from an acting perspective. But he also, from a personal life standpoint, is just utter chaos. And it, it starts in the early 80s with the fact he is married to Mary Beth Hurt for a number of years. And then he starts a common law marriage with Sandra Jennings. That comes complete with all sorts of lawsuits. He ends up divorcing Mary Beth Hurt in 1982. But just kind of springs him into a decade of some personal transgressions, including his uh, inability to be faithful at that moment in time. Very Dewey Cox of him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that is probably doing. They're often too compared. You can't be married to two people at the same time. Why not? I don't get it. Uh, he, as we'll talk about, he drinks a lot, like uh, Dewey Cox one did once upon a time. He did cocaine. <laughs> cocaine. <laughs> I reckon I want some of that cocaine. You want no part of this shit, man. <laughs> but our next review, 1981 as well. Same year, largest critic gap, and it is Eyewitness, and Case has it. Eyewitness is a 1981. I can't tell if it's a crime or a romance movie or a crime romance. It, it was tough to narrow this one down. It was written by Steve Tesich, who wrote Breaking Away, American Flyers, and The World According to Garp. And he teams up in Eyewitness with Peter Yates who directed Breaking Away in 1979, and the two of them would later work in 1985 on the film Eleni. Breaking Away is a fucking awesome movie. Breaking Away rules. Yates is known 
for several movies, but probably the most famous that he directed was Bullet, starring Steve McQueen. So right off the bat, you've got a pretty good writer and a, and a pretty well-known and established director. As we've talked, William Hurt continues to get these big roles uh, really early in his career. And so this, what, probably his third, a third or fourth feature film, Kyle? Mm-hmm. Yep, something like that. He's kicking ass at this point. Eyewitness stars William Hurt as a Vietnam vet who is a janitor at a New York City office building, which becomes the site of a murder and murder investigation. One of my problems with this movie is that every scene during the movie, I feel like we're given interesting thing about William Hurt's character, and here's why he's just more than a janitor. And it, that part started getting very annoying to me. As the movie goes on, you understand why they do that, because... He has a uh, infatuation with Sigourney Weaver, who is a famous news reporter in New York City. And so in order to connect those two dots, clearly a janitor would never catch the eye of a famous news reporter, right? <laughs> so let's make him the most interesting person on the planet. But once the two of them kind of get together and develop this relationship, they basically set out to solve the murder of a uh, influential Vietnamese businessman in the building that William Hurt worked. And William Hurt and his buddy, played by James Woods, are two, I wouldn't say they're like the main characters, but they're definitely people of of interest by the police. It's about all those things. It's a mystery. It's a romance. Like I said before, I can't really tell if it's a crime drama or what, but it's well done. One of the problems that hurts this movie for me, the pacing of it is not great for what I personally like. But at the time, I'm sure it was very, very of the moment. I thought he was good in the movie, though, and, and he did a good job with what the character was doing and, and the things that they were going about. So Garney Weaver was really good at this point. I mean, this probably was right at the beginning of her biggest days. James Wood was really good as kind of the pain-in-the-ass friend. However, if you're wanting to know how and where Morgan Freeman got typecast as a detective solving crimes or fighting through conspiracies. Eyewitness is your film. <laughs> this is probably only his second or third role as well. Even if like, you weren't watching the TV, the second you heard him come on the screen, you would have known exactly who it was. And, and he was pretty good in the movie. He also lets you know that he's black. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Easy to remember, right, Warren? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like that typical trope where it's like, I'm Detective Black, this is Detective White. <laughs> it's like, I'm the black guy. That should be easy for you to remember. <laughs> you said Woods is pretty good in this? Yes, I, I liked him in there. He's a scumbag. Is he as good as he is when he's pooping enchiladas in Scary Movie 2? Like, <laughs> how does it compare to that moment? <laughs> I would have likened his character more to his role in Digstown. Okay. Overall, I thought the movie was fine. You know, this is the highest critic gap, so critics liked it more than fans. I'd land in the middle. I do think overall the direction of the writing movie leaned towards the critic likings and tendencies, which is probably why it did better. I wouldn't have any problem recommending the movie or if I was on again watching it as well. Craig, like you were saying, with it being called like, it's like the janitor and then this and then this. The movie was was released in the UK first under the title Janitor. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and everybody was like this is so stupid it really is just like the story of this janitor and like you find out more and more stuff about him and then they're like well this is just stupid so we got to change the name i found that pretty entertaining that is a good little fun <laughs> that is super entertaining <laughs> mm-hmm. thanks case yeah man we've only covered two years of his film work but he's doing some great work early on our next review isn't until 1998 We've got 17 years to cover, and as we'll talk about here, he does some big things, especially in the early to mid-80s. So first things first, he's in A Midsummer Night's Dream as Oberon. He also did the stage version of that in uh, 82, and he follows that up with The Big Chill as Nick in 83. It was like a cultural phenomenon. I think it was a huge hit among the demographic of the people that the film has represented in it. You know, people who all went to... University of Michigan in the 60s and then went on on to do different things. But it's also notable because it's the second collaboration between uh, Lawrence Kasdan, the director of Body Heat, and Hurt. Here we go. They go on to do to do another film in the in the late 80s to the Accidental Tourist, which we'll we'll talk about a little bit. Same year, he's in Gorky Park, plays a Russian character with a Russian accent, kind of. So he was pretty bad with the Russian accent, huh? It's like Russian light. 
You know what I mean? It's almost uh, like he's he's just like dipping his toes into the water. Really, every actor in the movie is just dipping their toes into the water. So I guess they're consistent from that standpoint. It definitely is not an immersive Russian character that you might have seen in other movies over the years. So this is, what, early 80s? 83. I wonder if there was an, an intentionality in movies made in the early to mid 80s to make Russians sound like just assholes that have... You know, by using a shitty accent. Oh, yeah. I've seen Red. You saying uh, Dolph Lundgren had a bad accent? <laughs> <laughs> I would 100% say Dolph's was better than Hearst and Gorky Park. More believable. I was like you. Nice. More one-liners. <laughs> but he follows that up in 85 with his first Oscar nomination and Oscar win for Kiss of the Spider Woman. He plays Luis Molina. Also won a BAFTA for Best Actor and got the Best Male Performance at the Cannes Film Festival that year, which he beat out Jack Nicholson for his role in Prizzy's Honor, which we talked about on the Angelica Houston mm, episode. Good one. Based on what I read in regards to interviews, it was... The character actor style of William Hurt that actually made the director and the screenwriter change the character from originally a gay character into a trans character. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Which apparently was like a revelation of a decision because he ended up winning an Academy Award for it. Raul's good. He plays a political prisoner who's kind of, you know, fighting a revolution. And so there's this back and forth between his character and Hurt's trans character. I think your point about how they change the character is important. His portrayal is not comical. It, there are times when it's over the top, but it's, I want to say, more grounded mm -hmm. in how he approaches it. You know, it wasn't like I watched it and was blown away and was like, oh, that's definitely an Oscar winning performance. But I, I, you could watch it and say, All right, yeah, I can definitely see him getting a nomination. I could see why B. Nicholson. I don't think Nicholson was Oscar winner for Prizzy's Honor. The way the story's told is really unique. It's it's him narrating two different fake movies while they're in prison together and kind of telling his story through these fake movies that he's come up with. Mm -hmm. And how they weave the story together through those movies by the end is it's it's unique. It's nothing I've really seen before. So I think that the screen the screenplay construction probably helped a lot. Mm -hmm. I think Cabaret was the one that won a, a lot more stuff in 72. Mm. Mm, there we go. All right, so mid-80s, I'm going to mention some more stage work that he did. So he was in Hamlet, Henry V, 5th, 5th of July, Richard II, and as I mentioned, A Midsummer Night's Dream. And he got a Tony nomination for his work on Broadway's Hurley Burley in 85. By the middle of the 80s, the yearbook had come true that he had gotten the Tony nomination for his work on Broadway. But then he followed that up. So we talked about Kiss of the Spider Woman. He, he got nominated and won the Oscar. The year later, he's in Children of a Lesser God as James, and he gets nominated for another Oscar. This movie was awesome. I really liked it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was really impressed as well. Where they're at the dance at the end of the movie, and they like kind of reunite. That scene like wrecked me. I was not prepared to be like that emotionally invested in it. I think this is his best acting role. It's a super unique movie because obviously he plays a uh, teacher at a at a school for for deaf kids, and Marley Matlin is is the, his love interest in it. She's a school employee. She's a janitor, and she's deaf. And they communicate together. The only how you would think uh, because most people can't read sign language, you think the way that they do it is like by subtitles. But basically, he repeats everything. Yeah, for the audience. Yeah, for the audience. He has to repeat everything that she's signing to him. So super interesting movie and very unique. Obviously, it's based on a play, so it's not that original, but great movie. I was I was really into it, and I really enjoyed it. He basically closed captions the entire movie for you as the yeah. audience. The crazy thing about this movie is that the uh, French title is Janitor 2. Uh, <laughs> direct, direct remake to 1981's Eyewitness. It's crazy. <laughs> the tenderness that he has with the students that when he's teaching them is really, really good. Yeah, uh, like I you agree. said, Kyle, it, I think this is his best role. There's no room for tenderness in the teaching game. <laughs> <laughs> Podcast of teachers, and none of us are tender. <laughs> so he meets Marley Matlin on set, and they develop a relationship from that. They date technically for a year, and I think they lived together for almost two years. And she wrote an autobiography years later where she talks about a lot of alleged drug abuse and physical mm -hmm. abuse from William Hurt. And not a great look after you know doing this really fantastic portrayal of a stage play and getting an Oscar nom, and then you decided to 
potentially abuse the uh, the deaf girl. Not great. We'll see it here shortly because he goes on this historic run of movies and their critical successes um, and then kind of disappears for uh, a while from Hollywood mm-hmm. and his career completely changes. And it's because of the trend that the public was just not aware of that Marley Matlin describes in her memoir where he is someone who is struggling with mental illness related to his drug and alcohol abuse. And it is a consistent trend for him where he has toxic relationships and he's in and out of rehab. Mm -hmm. And so when you're watching this movie, they start dating during the filming of this movie. And so you can see where that chemistry comes from. And in the movie, it's kind of toxic as well. And you're like, Oh, all right. Well, now that I know that backstory, I kind of understand why on film it works well together, but it's just so sad to hear after the fact. Well, 87, he's on fire. He, uh, he rolls the turkey. He's in broadcast news as Tom, and he gets his third Oscar nomination, third year in a row. I don't understand why he got nominated. I thought he was good in it, but I think there's just something about these 80s dramas that I don't fully understand where, like, the Academy wanted to just reward things that they thought were smart. And mm. I watched this like, oh, it's a good movie, but is it, you know, nominated for all these Academy Awards? I don't think so. And then you see what it's up against. And it's up against movies that I said that about on the last podcast, mm-hmm. like Prizzy's Honor, where I was like, yeah, it's a fine movie. Would I give it all these no- Academy Award nominations? No. But maybe that was just the trend of dramas and romance movies back in the 80s. Literally yesterday, I, I saw an article from IndieWire where they said for Valentine's Day, they listed the 55 best romantic comedies of all time and this was literally number two on the list really get yeah. out of here james I, I'm, I'm with you on like the broad, I, i'm thinking i'm with everybody on broadcast news like I, I it's a pretty boring fucking movie and if you had told me that that wasn't albert brooks but that was steve gutenberg i'd totally believe you <laughs> <laughs> Show Albert Brooks some respect. It was directed by James L. Brooks, The Simpsons. Yeah. Which is why I think I think that's why the Academy loved it so much, because his movie that he did before this was Terms of Endearment, which won Best Picture. So I think they were just like, we're, we, we love this guy, and we're just going to let him keep riding it. Context. Context yeah. is important for that. Yeah. What I was reading, I haven't seen the movie, is that William Hurt was pretty good cast for the type of role. Do you? Oh, all yeah. That's accurate? Yeah, definitely. He, he's good in it. He's really good in it. He plays the... The anchor who is skyrocketing, his career just keeps going up and up because everyone likes him. But like, he's sincere like the entire time. He's just a good looking guy who's doing well at work. And Holly Hunter is like the snapping necks, no holds bar career woman. And when they kind of meet each other, it's like, oh, is he going to sweep her off her feet or is she going to stay with her career? If it was made in the mid 2000s, his role would have been played by Aaron Eckhart. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, good yeah, good, good, yeah, very good call. It's an yeah. Aaron Sorkin movie that doesn't exist yet, <laughs> or Will Ferrell. Would Anchorman have happened without broadcast news? <laughs> that is the question. <laughs> we'll leave our audience to ponder as we transition to talking about how William Hurt was named by Playgirl magazine as on their list of sexiest men in the eighties. Good for William. That's really disappointing. Spread my, <laughs> spread my butt cheeks for Playgirl Magazine. <laughs> Mike my Concho. Concho. <laughs> I know that uh, you had already said that um, he was nominated three years in a row for uh, Kiss the Spider Woman, Children of a Lesser God, and Broadcast News, all for the Best Actor category. And I, I got some Oscar trivia here that I, if we time permitting, if if I can throw it out, I think hit I think it absolutely. Let's do it, man. Let's do it. Can we name the last actor with three acting? nominations in a row doesn't have to be from the same category this one in particular i'm talking about actor supporting actor actor all three years in a row joaquin phoenix tom hanks meryl streep i feel like she's nominated every year the most recent one is bradley cooper from 2012 to 2014 where he was nominated for best actor in sue lang's playbook supporting actor for american hustle actor for american sniper can we name the most recent actor to be nominated for best actor three years in a row it is not william hurt there's one in between oh wow is it not tom hanks more recent more recent than william hurt and it's not tom hanks somewhere in the 90s who was dominating the 90s end of the 90s into the 2000s kevin spacey nope good guess though that is a good guess the answer is russell crowe for the insider gladiator and a beautiful mind and he won for the gladiator damn 
I was going to say Keanu Reeves, but I've been way off. <laughs> Can we name the last actress to be nominated for Best Actress three years in a row? This is in the early 80s. I feel like it's Amy Adams because she's been nominated a thousand times and they refuse to give that poor woman an award. I know. Yep. Give me uh, oh, Jessica Lang. No, good guess. Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep is correct. The French lieutenant's woman, Sophie's Choice, and Silkwood. Nice. Ugh, Sophie's Choice. I believe in 79, she was nominated for Kramer versus Kramer. So she was nominated four of five years for Best Actress. Um, that's why, she's, that's why she's the GOAT, man. Right before that is Jane Fonda for Julia Coming Home and the China Syndrome. Before William Hurt, the last actor to be nominated three years in a row for Best Actor, is Jack Nicholson, The Last Detail, Chinatown, and One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest. And then the last question I'll ask, can we name the last actor to be nominated for an acting Oscar, porting and actor, so combine them, four years in a row? The years are 1972 to 1975. Holy shit. Marlon Brando. No, but uh, you couldn't be closer. Al Pacino. Al Pacino. Name Fuck. the movies, Mark. Name the movies. Ooh, uh, Serpico, Dog Day Afternoon, Godfather, Godfather 2. Yeah, but you got him in the wrong order. Supporting actor, Godfather, actor, Serpico, actor, Godfather, part two, actor, Dog Day Afternoon. There you go. Nice. It puts it into context, and I think that's the important Yeah, part. it does. Yeah. Something like that, three years in a row, best actor all in one category. You know, we've covered a lot of actors up to this point where it's a lot in the supporting categories, but someone that's been in the lead three years in a row, that's pretty rare. Thanks, John. I think that helped. Yep. I think this just means that the 80s sucked. <laughs> I think James would support you on that. Dude, some awesome horror movies. I was born in the 80s. Barely, <laughs> 80s yeah, sucked. we were both there. <laughs> the last movie we'll note in the 80s is The Accidental Tourist. John mentioned earlier, uh, he, he got the Ty- Taiwan's Golden Horse Award for Best Foreign Actor for that one. And it was his uh, third movie of the 80s with Larry Kasdan. And that's The Accidental Tourist. Those are the 80s. And that takes us to 91 to his role in The Doctor is Jack. He got a Best Actor nom from the Chicago Film Critics for that one. You know, just blowing up the world. And then also 91, he's in a movie called Until the End of the World. It is a movie that is on the Criterion channel. There is a five-hour director's cut. I watched it earlier today. It is like two completely different movies in one. It kind of feels like Full Metal Jacket in that sense, where the first one's like a film noir. And then it quickly turns into this like sci-fi fantasy film that makes eerily accurate predictions about how technology is going to transform into the 90s and 2000s. Oh, wow. The base one that's on YouTube is two and a half hours long. Like I said, the director's cut is five hours long. I did not watch that one. Vin Vendors, is that how you say it? He's a weird dude. The same He's director strange, of Paris, Texas. Guy. Yep. He's a weird dude. He like creates the dialogue of the film as they're going. But to add to the Hurt legend, this is really when his life starts to change. Apparently, I read, and it didn't name who the actors were, because there's three as part of this love triangle, but part of the Ebert review I read was that two of the actors who were romantically involved in the movie were not on speaking terms the entire time as they filmed in like 16 different countries. I'm assuming they're talking about the main actress and William Hurt and not Sam Neill. I feel like Sam Neill is not the kind of person that would not be on speaking terms with an actress. But who knows? What I read a lot about William Hurt is that he's tremendously difficult to work Mm -hmm. with when it comes to direction and filming movies because he is such a... Perfectionist is what I saw. Thespian, yeah, perfectionist that he he needs people to understand that we are creating art. (laughs) And so he second guests everyone else's efforts. And if he doesn't think the director is fully committed, then he won't commit. Some directors love working with him because they know that, but the majority of directors look at it like it's a hassle. And when you pair that at this time with issues with substance abuse and issues with relationship issues, it's easier for someone just to go, I just don't think I'm going to work with that guy anymore. I'll Mm -hmm. figure it out with someone else. You see it because it drastically impacts his career. I mean, you go from... Brand spank a new actor who crushes it in, you know, seven years. He's in multiple Academy Award nominated roles and multiple Academy Award nominated movies to almost completely disappearing from the Hollywood scene uh, is a drastic downturn. He moved to France, bought a villa out there in early 90s. He, he, in fact, he turned down a role in Jurassic Park to uh, kind of go off the grid because 
he kind of had to get his life together. That's why there's a big gap between 91 and the next movie we're going to talk about in 95. Kyle, didn't he marry a French actress? Yep. Yeah. And they had a kid, correct? And that's why yep. he was gone for so long. He eventually moved back to the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, he was gone for a while, living in Paris. They met while both in rehab together. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, supporting one another in a foreign country. So good for Which them. Which sometimes can work and sometimes mm-hmm. can't. <laughs> the first movie we're going to note as coming out of that is a movie co- called Smoke. He plays a character named Paul in 95. Craig, I listened to that interview you sent over from your boy Ron Bennington, and he mentions it in there as a very New York City movie. Yeah, yeah it's a cool movie. It's basically about how these people's lives sort of join together in, within this uh, cigar shop in uh, West Village in New York. It's cool. He, he's like a depressed widower in his, in his role. Plays it pretty well. Harvey Keitel is good in it. One of the first big ones he comes out of, I guess, mini retirement to play. There are some others in here. We're not going to hit all of them. But like 97, he's in Loved as a character named KD. It's a low-budget film where Robin Wright really steals the show. But I mentioned this one because I was watching it and Kelsey's watching over my shoulder. And she goes, he looks like a founding father in that role. <laughs> looks like he could he could do the Ben Franklin biopic. And I was like, well, that, that'll, give every, that'll give our listeners a, a visual of... Like his gray hair ponytail set up and glasses. I don't think he would have made Playgirls magazine's uh, Sexiest Man Alive in 97 by that point. <laughs> the years had taken a toll. <laughs> yeah, drug and alcohol recovery usually <laughs> don't lead to you looking great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, that led him ultimately to taking a role in 98's Lost in Space, which is our lowest critic score. And uh, Mark's going to talk about it. Oh, boy. So Lost in Space is based off a, a TV show from the 60s, 1998, as Kyle mentioned. Science fiction movie. William Hurt plays Professor John Robinson and his wife, uh, played by Mimi Rogers, also is a professor. Basically, I'll just say this movie is – or Interstellar, it is not. Even though the plot from – the basic plot sounds very similar. They they find that soon uh, – this the plot takes place in 2060, I think is what it was, like 2055 i think something um along those lines but yeah. basically the the earth is headed towards disaster because of pollution and ozone depletion and william hurt and his family decide that they will, will f- try to find a way to to another planet for the pl- for the population to to live uh safely there as opposed to the the earth which is soon to be extinct on their way there they are hijacked by God, I don't know why he took this role, Gary Oldman, and the Global <laughs> Sedition. They're a terrorist group. I'm trying to think of it even how to describe it. I, I won't even get into the plot of it because it's so ridiculous, but the special effects in this movie are god awful. It it's honestly like <laughs> it's on it was honestly like watching Saturday morning like Power Rangers from back like the mid nineties. That's how bad it is. I mentioned that I was waiting for Turbo Man to arrive because it was so cheesy and campy. <laughs> You know, they could have cast just about anybody. I think that's a money grab for a lot of these actors, like Heather Graham, like William Hurt. A young Lacey Chabert is in it, who I didn't even yeah, know she that. Is. I was like, is that her? Because, like, the only way I knew it was her because it, it was her voice, but she, like, looks. I mean, this is one of her first roles, and poor thing. I mean, I wish she would have done something else, but Matt LeBlanc, I mean. He was the worst cast of all of them. He was terrible. If you're making an action movie, I'm not going to Matt LeBlanc. I'm sorry. Anyway, it's it's really bad, and the, the reviews sort of speak for themselves. Roger Ebert hated it, and a lot of the the critics that I that I go to for for trusted movie sources hated it, which means that I had a hard time getting through it. I think going back to what I said, I think William Hurt has not chosen a lot of roles based on money and based off box office appeal. I think this was probably one of them. You know, I'm just kind of speculating, but that could have been just from he was out of Hollywood for a long time and maybe he just needed a quick paycheck. Mm -hmm. This is a bad movie. Craig, you said last time that I get somehow always get the best movies. I'm going to I'm going to have to disagree (laughs) with you there. So very uh, thwarted. You do not want to compare this to Horrid Henry. (laughs) Let me just say I'm glad Interstellar came out because the plots in a weird way, it's very similar. And Interstellar kicks ass in this movie. Uh, I'd want to flush down the toilet. So I'm assuming it's related to the Robinson family, like Lost in Space story, correct? Yes. Yes, it is. It's based on it's the sixties. Okay. The sixties TV show is what it's based off of. So, it, which was a huge. It was a big hit back then. This was just an adaptation gone wrong. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. I think this is a, a case of it not working. There were some pretty easy things that they could have changed just to make this better. Aside from like the cast, 
like the entire cast. But yeah. <laughs> yes, accurate. Any movie that has a like the villain, uh, somebody who is sabotaging a mission or a task or anything, a person who's clearly sabotaging it, you catch them and you let them hang around. <laughs> no shit bad stuff's going to continue to happen. And that happens within the first, like, 15 minutes of the mm-hmm. movie. And you're like, well, I wonder if this is going to come back and fuck him up. Yeah, of course it does. <laughs> and and then in that stupid, when he gets, like, fucked up by the bugs and that terrible, terrible CGI <sighs> and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's atrocious. The movie just absolutely sucks. Didn't they learn from heavyweights? You don't let kids keep track of the villain, right? Like, you don't, outside the cage, it's yep. not a good idea. Like, I'm a beat find man. A way out. <laughs> I'm a beat. Here's a Hershey's kiss. <laughs> Your queen would be proud. Your queen would be proud. The only casting that I didn't hate was Jared Harris as the older Will character. Yeah. He was whatever. Yeah. I'm okay with that. But like Warren said, I don't think it's hyperbolic to say you need to change the entire cast. Heather Graham is miscast. Matt LeBlanc is miscast. Gary Oldman is miscast. William Hurt's just whatever. Yep, I agree. Hated it. Yep, I was. It was not a fun, not a fun review for me this time. After watching some really good sci-fi movies for like the Rockwell podcast, where we're talking Moon, Moon was good. Mm-hmm. Galaxy Quest, like I was like, all right, maybe Lost in Space will be similar. No, it was absolutely atrocious. Sorry, Rigby. I'll get the Godfather next week, Craig. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Our next review isn't until 2019, so we've got 21 years to cover, and then we'll pretty much be right at the end of a. 2020 where we're i guess 2021 i'm not used to saying 2021 so the fourth floor 99 a very campy movie where he plays a character named greg we get to see uh, tobin bell acting outside of saw which i didn't realize was a thing honestly i thought saw was his first movie ever <laughs> first and only just no those, dude he's yeah. he's a bad guy in a lot of movies for the firm and and uh in the line of fire but the fourth floor from what i remember about william hurt's character is for the longest time you think that because the plot revolves around him trying to convince his girlfriend, played by Julia Juliet Lewis. Lewis, to move in with him. She's basically living in the place from hell. So, like, for the longest time, you think that he's doing these things to her to, like, in a weird way, like, force her to move in with him. Um, and I just kind of remember being very underwhelmed by his character. Like, he really is just kind of like this, like, pussy pushover in it. Um Correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle, but that's what I recall about his character. Yeah, I know. I think I know Case and I watched it. He, his character yeah. disappears for a long chunk in the second act, and then he pops up at the end to kind of be the hero. Well, Kyle, at the end, Tobin Bell has got a painting of mm-hmm. of uh, William Hurt and the actual killer. Mm-hmm. He is one of the bad guys in the movie. Yep. Yeah, it flips pretty quick at the end there. Yeah. But that's probably more than enough conversation about the fourth floor. Agreed. Uh, people, <laughs> but it's on Tubi. If y'all want to check it out, it is available there. Our listening audience, 2000, he is in Dune, the miniseries as Duke. So obviously we've got the, the Dune movie coming out this year. So we'll see how that compares over the next couple of years. He's in some, bi- uh, some bigger films. He's an AI artificial intelligence as professor hobby. It's a Spielberg film from Oh one. So that's a pretty bold project with a uh, Haley Joel Osment. I know Warren hates the word bold when it comes to projects, but it, it certainly was at that point in time. Was it bold or ambitious? Ambitious is the worst one. I guess ambitious <laughs> is the more... It's, it's an alright film. It's okay. The movie can be terrible. I think ambitious. it was brave. I think it was brave. <laughs> brave. <laughs> Courageous. <laughs> very correct. Warren's very brave. His character is important, but minimal screen time in that one. Speaking of 2002, he's in Changing Lanes. He plays Doyle's sponsor. Very brief in that, too. Makes an appearance on The King of Queen, and then he's in Tuck Everlasting, one of the few movies he's in that's on Disney+. Plus. Plays the dad in that one. Good steady force, slight accent, pretty good character overall for him there. And then he enters the M. Night Shyamalan universe in 2004's The Village as Edward, the architect of this grand experiment on a wildlife reserve. Spoiler! Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> I really think the movie the movie could have been better. Adrian Brody's character is like the dumbest thing ever. Um, insufferable. <laughs> insufferable. Literally the dumbest thing. Aside from his character, like I, I get the rest of it. It's just it really is just Adrian Brody's character that did not have to be in it whatsoever. <laughs> At least we got the silver lining of him dying a gruesome death at the end. So there's that. 
at least. Yeah. This was the first M Night movie that I didn't like because his first three I thought were great, and then this came out and I was like, oh, that movie kind of a bit of a letdown. And then the next one I saw after that was The Happening, and that is where <laughs> I verbally said out loud Never. after the movie end, "I'm fucking done with M Night Shyamalan." <laughs> Yeah, the happening because <laughs> this movie was such a letdown and then the happening was like he was trying to be awful and it started the trend of m night having movies where you're like oh that's a pretty cool idea but it's a horrific terribly executed movie tom i need a ride home <laughs> is that from signs no that's from scary movie it's three. from scary movie three oh, that's right <laughs> when, tom i need a ride home i need a ride home he just he just killed he just killed his wife He's like <laughs> Um, I need a ride home. <laughs> who's, the, who's the actor who says that? Oh, I can't remember. Because it's M. Night Shyamalan in Signs, right? He, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. It's he his character in Signs. It's an eight mile Signs crossover, right? That's yeah. a major part of that. <laughs> the village, I mean, the, the freaking cast is crazy. I, I didn't realize how mm. good the cast is. Brennan Gleason, Brody, Sigourney mm-hmm. Weaver, BDH, William Hurt, Bryce Dallas Howard. Joaquin, Jesse Eisenberg plays a small role, Cherry Jones, Fran Krantz, who we talked about last time, and Judy Greer. It's an awesome cast, but I don't know, man. I, I rewatched it and watched like some videos, like one person being like, this is great, and one person being like, this is trash. He does a good job with the themes and, and colors, and it, Roger Deakins is the cinematographer, so it's a beautiful movie. It has a great score, but the logical issues of like, like how do you get them to not have a, to have a no-fly zone over your nature preserve? Like, it, like shit like that where you're like all right guy i just think all, all of his stuff just it would it's i bet his scripts are just absolutely incredible and they're all just all he does is he writes incredible books mm-hmm. this is and then he's like now i'm going to try and film this and it just sucks <laughs> and it, it yeah. just sucks the actor who plays the guy in scary movie 3 is the dude in office space the fucking piece of shit the hey, yes. <laughs> like a bolt <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 no uh, not Michael Samir, Borg. Uh, Samir not going to work Samir. anymore. Yeah, oh, yeah. The, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Who uh, Laura went to film yeah. school with. Yeah, went to school with him. That was her acting partner. That's right. Wicked. The Beneke universe continues to expand. Look at this. <laughs> All right, so then 05, his other Oscar nomination at, in A History of Violence is Richie. This time, best supporting. I think we kind of mentioned how William Hurt's career sucked in the 90s after, after such a heavy decade in the 80s. And we can say whatever we want about his personal life, but in terms of him as an actor, I think he comes back with like a vengeance in this movie. This movie's fucking awesome. Um, yeah, it's, it's very yeah. enjoyable, and his character's creepy as hell, and just it's very good. Surprisingly, a lot of people I know have not even seen it nor heard of it, which is very disappointing. Another good trivia question: This is the last movie to be commercially released as a VHS tape in the United States, so that's very cool. From two thousand five, <laughs> it's not bad. It's a nice little. Uh, Nice little nugget to uh, quiz your friends on. But History of Violence is great, and William Hurt's character as as the Mafia brother is fantastic. <laughs> the scene where he where Viggo Mortensen escapes from his office, like mm-hmm. my my heart's like pounding during that scene. It's really, really intense. Good movie for sure. This is one of the record holders. It's it's in the top ten for shortest amount of screen time to be nominated for an Academy Award. Mm. Yeah. It like- was only in the movie for eight minutes. Yep. Damn. Interesting. That is very short. And that shows how kind of commanding his he is in the movie because he's he's just so yeah. fucking he's so creepy and just the oh, way he talks and presents himself it's it's something. Jesus, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> to your point, Rigby, in the mid two thousands, mid to late two thousands, I mean, he's in a lot of good movies. He's in Seriana. He's in The Good Shepherd. He's in Mister Brooks. I mean. I don't know if those are big roles on his part, but he's in some pretty decent movies there in the mid 2000s. Mm-hmm. And right in between all of those, he's in a something you can find on YouTube. It's from Stephen King. It's called Nightmares and Dreamscapes from the stories of Stephen King. If you watch it, it's I think it was shown on like TNT or TBS back in the day in the mid 2000s. It's cool because there's no dialogue in the entire episode, which sounds boring, but the whole concept is he plays a hitman who takes out a toy manufacturer and then the wife or mother of the toy manufacturer sends a box to his house that is full of toy soldiers. And then all the toy soldiers come to life and he goes into an all out fucking shootout (laughs) similar to small soldiers, but much cooler. 
than small soldiers where he's they're chop they're flying choppers at him shooting rockets at him that sounds pretty cool to be honest yeah it's, I don't an, know. it's an hour long it's on youtube it's really fun to watch yeah that sounds enjoyable william hurts awesome there's no dialogue at any point from his character just him grunting and bleeding and dealing with utter chaos so i won't spoil anything for you guys in case you check it out i love small soldiers so it's fun so another good movie in the mid 2000s season into the wild plays a character named walt he and the other characters got a sag nom for outstanding ensemble in that movie people have told me i look like emil hirsch <laughs> pretty much any white guy with a tan people tell me i look like him he's got a small role in this but you know the scene where they meet for breakfast and he kind of reveals to him why he's doing what he's doing you kind of see why emil hirsch decides to throw his life mm-hmm. in the trash can and desert everybody because his parents are dicks to him liars yeah. lied yeah. about yep. has bastard yeah. child and lied to the kids and yep. those kind of parents that are only concerned with the pr of their kids success not actually happiness he has to be a lawyer because of the of the you know the money that comes with it and the and all that stuff so good movie it's on netflix check it out and then also, 07, we go to uh, the movie that Craig mentioned in his box <laughs> office report, and that is Noise, where uh, Hurt plays Mayor Schneer, the mayor of New York City. With, with a terrible wig. It all, it's like a red, I don't know, it's like an orange red wig. It's awful. Yeah, that was his actor choice. That's what he wanted to do <laughs> for the role. The guy that made this movie, he's a writer and he lived in New York City and he got so pissed one night, he finally snapped because of all the car alarms going off in his neighborhood that he actually got arrested breaking into a car to turn off the car alarm. The way that he could fight back against this was to write and, and direct this movie. You know, it was interesting. They asked him, and how did you cast it? Was it all just like casting calls? And he's like, yeah, well, no. Uh, Tim Robbins, I liked him, so I asked him, and he said he would. And then, oh yeah, William Hurt, I, I sent him the script, and he said he liked it. So I cast William Hurt. And I'm like, how the fuck do you end up getting those two guys to do this project? It's just a very bizarre story behind the making of this movie. I was interested from your guys' perspective, if, it, if you thought it, his mania was justified, because it takes that premise... And it just extrapolates on it. So he starts vandalizing tons of cars. He ends up leaving a calling card when he does it. Then he starts scheming to try to figure out how the hell can I like criminalize people leaving their fucking car alarms on for five minutes at a time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Tim Robbins, is he's just delightful. He's awesome. When you were explaining that to me, that is absolutely a story written by someone who lived in New York City. I know mm-hmm. I said this in our group chat, but <laughs> anyone who lives in New York City at any point in their life goes through this kind of realization that they love the energy of the city, but at least once a day they're like, man, fuck this place. Yes. Why the hell do I why the hell do yeah. I live here? This movie is one where he just fucking snaps. And yeah. And he, he starts with small crime and it it, it gets pretty uh, out of hand quickly. 2008, he's in the, ye- the yellow handkerchief as Brett. Uh, he plays an ex-convict I'm alongside Maria Bello, Eddie Redmayne, and Kristen Stewart. He spent a night in prison, and he said it was very moving for him because he talked to people all night and asked them about being inmates and what they would do after they got out of prison and, and all this stuff. And he said it was wild because he never saw anybody he talked to. And I thought that was really interesting prep for this particular role. I bet those people in prison were pissed off they didn't get to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking asshole, William Hurt. Piece of shit. Yeah. It's a good, decent movie. He plays a good role. It's it's more subtle on his end than, than some of the other stuff he's done. Also, 08, he's in Vantage Point as president in Ashton. And then he makes his MCU appearance in The Incredible Hulk as General Thunderbolt Ross who I think Warren said last time is not the best MCU character. He's actually not that bad as the role. It's just all the Hulk movies suck individually, mm. but he's, he's a pretty big character. He's going to be in black widow. Yep. I'm not sure to what extent, but since that's a little bit earlier, you know, Thunderbolt Thaddeus Ross, he is the red Hulk. So he's like a nemesis of the green Hulk. He's going to make more appearances. I mean, he's in Civil War, Infinity War, and Endgame. Hologram and Endgame, right? Yeah, they're so tiny. Like, he, his role in Civil War is like a press briefing, uh, a funeral in Infinity War, and Endgame is like a hologram. 
My hot take on his role is I think he was in the right in trying to kill the Incredible Hulk. I think a general should absolutely try to kill this beast that's just slaughtering everything it sees. You know, Tim Roth took it a little far in the movie, but I am uh, I would gladly <laughs> reelect General Thunderbolt on this one. <laughs> I love how the Rigby is. It's fucking crickets. Yeah. <laughs> Are you guys talking about basketball? Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking about these roller coasters of movies. When Kyle talked about Tony Stark dying, I was like, dude, spoilers. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. My bad. Well, speaking of it, an Endgame that the Rigby's might know, he's in the movie Endgame in 2009 as Professor, I can't pronounce his last name, well, he got a Satellite Award nomination for Best Actor for that. And we're just going to rip through the 2010s because looking at the rest of our list, there's not a lot to like substantively talk about, which is pretty yeah. similar to our Jellica Houston la- conversation mm-hmm. last time. So he's in the show Damages in 2009. He plays a neurotic lawyer alongside Glenn Close, Rose Byrne, Marsha Gay Harden. He got a primetime Emmy nomination for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama for that. So if you like those types of TV shows, um, he did a pretty good job in that, I suppose. He's in Robin Hood. He's in Moby Dick alongside Ethan Hawke. He's in Too Big to Fail. He got Golden Globe, Primetime Emmy, and Satellite Noms for Best Actor for that TV movie that's on HBO. He's great in that movie as former Secretary of the Treasury Hank Paulson. And yep. the rest of the casting in that movie also kicks ass. Everybody is in it. Paul G. is Ben Bernanke, and he's really good in it, too. Mm-hmm. He plays the main character. It revolves completely around him to the point where the final shot is him staring out a window, wondering if uh, the big banks are going to fix their issues and distribute money appropriately. Foreshadowing. <laughs> he's in Hellgate. He was diagnosed with terminal prostate cancer, I believe, in 2012. I couldn't find an exact date. I was just going based on some of the things I was reading. But I believe he, terminal, shouldn't be around still. But he found some really revolutionary treatment, and he's still around. So good for him yeah. dealing with that. I don't know if you guys knew that. Yeah, I did. He's in Bonnie and Clyde. He got a satellite nom for Best Supporting Actor in that one. A little crossover with Jessica Chastain in The Disappearance of Eleanor Rigby. Both her and him, both of those movies, they were came out a year apart. Another crossover with one of Rigby's favorite movies, Days and Nights, with Allison mm-hmm. Janney as Herb. So in 2014, one of the wildest stories we've encountered in our 30 episodes happens. Craig, tell us a little bit about it. William Hurt jumped on to play Greg Allman, the movie Midnight Rider, the Greg Allman story. And it was an independent film that was being... Written and directed and produced by Randall Miller, and Randall Miller eventually would be charged with manslaughter Mm. due to the filming of a movie. And uh, Randall Miller was actually found guilty, so he did end up serving time in prison. They were filming a scene where William Hurt, playing Greg Allman, was on a medical bed on a train track like a bridge. This is where it, it gets muddy. They were told that if a train did come, they would have 60 seconds to get off the tracks. Unfortunately, a train came, and tragically, one of the cast members was killed. Mm. The interesting thing about William Hurt in this movie is that he was like the first one that came up and was like, this isn't safe. Something feels off. And that probably ended up being pretty important in the court case. Yeah, negligence. Yeah. And everybody was just like, oh, okay, let's let's try it. And having read the articles, what I gathered is that they didn't have a permit to film there. And that's a huge reason why Correct. that kind of led to the prosecution. That's a huge mistrust with your actors, cast, and crew. And then the other part of it was I read that William Hurt is, is essentially the reason that they stopped filming because they wanted to continue even after she died. And William, as the big leading actor name on the project was the first one to say to honor her and her memory and her legacy i'm gonna take a step back i'm not gonna participate this anymore and once he did everyone else kind of flew the coop too so i'm not sure anything would have been different if he hadn't bailed from the project so good for william the only silver lining of this movie is that sarah jones the cast member that passed away because of it her family and friends you know made a really big push in hollywood to make sure that Safety and regulations became more of a focus. Hopefully, you know, because of of that tragedy, things got a little bit better in Hollywood. Let's hope. Let's hope. Then he's in a recurring role in the show Goliath, another lawyer role over three years, again alongside Maria Bello. But he was he's been in with with her a couple times, and he was also cast in the Coldest Game, 
before an offset injury, and he was replaced by Bill Pullman in 2018. I don't know what that offset injury was, but maybe he was, I don't know, fucking rock climbing like Inglorious Bastards. Busted his foot. Well, that takes us to our last full review, and that is the last full measure, our largest audience gap. And Warren, I'm sure, is just overjoyed to tell us about this movie. <laughs> this overly mediocre movie this movie is it's a hard one because like the factual story behind it is it's inspiring it it's a cool story so the whole thing's about this uh air force guy in vietnam pitsenbarger he was an actual person and he saved uh, a bunch of guys who were pinned down and were being shot and all this stuff and so that was true and he was nominated for a uh, Medal of Honor, and it was downgraded to like the Air the Air Force Cross or something like that. And this uh, reporter working on something else came across the story and kind of uncovered it in 1999, so 30 years after everything had happened, and kind of dug it up. That reporter died within like five or a couple years after he started digging it up and everything kind of fell on somebody else's desk. Then they ended up posthumously giving Pitsenbarger the presidential or the, uh, the medal of honor in front of his parents and all this stuff, which I mean, that's a cool story that they were able to do that. And they, mm -hmm. you know, uncovered a bunch of cool stuff. Yeah. What they end up doing with this movie, though, is they take the the good story and they add Sebastian Stan, who is kind of like the reporter guy, but they are inter like intertwining his life and how he starts out as this a very straight laced. I'm this guy. This is who I am, and how one guy's last you know devotion to his country kind of changes his life and his outlook on his family and all this stuff it, it's more of those sent like that part of it is like i get why they do it it's unnecessary to add in that stuff but that's what the people who go and watch these movies they need those things they need that that kind of connection to it this in my opinion is a great hour-long documentary where they get over mm -hmm. everything and it's factual based and no, no fluff but this movie had a 96 audience score i mean it's they're all older people i my guess is a majority are white and they just like I've, I've i've seen a couple movies that were very similar to this and they're the people who like applaud I, what was that that 13 Hours, the Benghazi movie with John Krasinski. Yeah. yeah. I went and saw that in theaters, and there was a line that Krasinski dropped in it where he was like, you're the brass, like, I don't listen to you. And, like, <laughs> half the crowd stood up and applauded. <laughs> and I was just like, give me a fucking break. I mean, so there, there, are, there are good things about the movie. Overall, it, it just really, like, with the cast, it comes out super, super flat. It's got Sebastian Stan, Chris, Christopher Plummer, William Hurt, Ed Harris, Samuel L. Jackson, Peter Fonda in his last movie. Diane Ladd. Yeah, Bradley Whitford. It is a very, very stacked cast, and it's less than two hours. And there, there are some emotional parts. Like They, they definitely play on that. It d can't tell if it's going to be this heartwarming movie or it's going to be informational. And it kind of loses out on both because it tries doing both. What was that movie with Andrew Garfield from a few years ago where he was saving all those people? Hacksaw Ridge. Yeah, Hacksaw Ridge. I, I felt like they were trying to like take advantage of like the Hacksaw Ridge audience and deliver something similar and it's nowhere even close. Yeah, Hacksaw Ridge is fucking awesome. I enjoyed Hacksaw Ridge a lot more than I thought I was going to. Me too. They made it seem like it was going to be super, super preachy. Mm -hmm. It did not come off as such. It, it was very, very well put together and it really focused on the war itself. It wasn't this statement of him being this conscientious objector and it was like, Let's just focus on that. Let's just focus on that. It was just, he was just like, no, fuck that. It is his character. He was like, I, I am who I am, but let me do my thing. Mm. So it was like, let me forget. Yeah. Forget about all this stuff. And this movie just like, I don't know. It, it just, man, it sounds like Billy Lynn's long halftime. <laughs> yeah. People were afraid to say it's bad because it's a movie about the troops and 
the impact their service has had on their lives and, you know, dealing with PTSD and it's just a bad movie. Like it could be a great inspiring story. That's just poorly filmed. That's a great way to put it because I went and I read an article. It was like, what's true about this movie. One of the articles that I read was from a, like a veterans group. And they're like, this movie does a terrible job of portraying veterans when they come home. This movie basically says everybody who comes home is fucked up in the head and they are not adjusting to society. Especially Peter Fonda's character in particular. Peter Fonda, he, I haven't slept at night in 35 years. Uh, <laughs> I only sleep during the day. You know, it, that kind of stuff. And it's just like, I'm, yes, there are people who do that. But every single person that they talk to in this movie, they are all severely damaged by PTSD. And it's just like, okay, I get it. I get it. War sucks. War sucks. And they're just hitting it over the fucking head. It makes them all look like nobody can help themselves when they come back. Were there any like crazy director or producer stories? Because there's 51 producers. Oh, wow. The movie was written like 20 years before it came out it took a long time for them to get funding then they wrote like they wrote some more and it did take a long time for it to get made yeah that makes sense hurt isn't bad in this movie he's not no. asked to is he's not asked to do much but he is very stern and he is adamant on fighting for this family. So he p takes care of Pittsburgh's parents because they're very old. And so that's like his payment to them. He was one of the, the guys in the helicopter with the, the character. And so yeah. he's like, he's doing his best to help out his family because he knows he gave his life for him. You know, that, that whole thing. So he's, he's good enough. He's not in it all that much, but he does a good enough job and he has a, a decent amount of depth and uh, emotion conveyed you know, yeah. of all the movies that I watched of him. This is the most emotion that he conveys in any of yeah. them. What, in that scene later in the movie where he's breaking down and tells him to fuck off, like yeah. you see him actually do some pretty good acting. There's a lot of depth there. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> All right, well, that's the last full measure. Last thing to mention is uh, William Hurt's performance in the show Condor as Bob from 2018 to 2020. And that takes us all the way to modern day and to Rigby's top performances list, which 50% chance it's coming from ComingSoon.net. We actually got a, a more well-known source this time. This is from The Guardian. Ooh. JohnRigby.com. Oh. <laughs> It is from 2016, so it doesn't. It won't include the movie that Warren just reviewed, The Last Full Measure, um, which it sounds like it probably shouldn't anyway. But this is five of William Hurt's best on-screen roles. Who wants to stat? Bless her God. Altered States. Altered States is on here. Well deserved. Devastating. Children of a Lesser God is not on here. What? Wow. That's Ubar. my favorite performance of his. So. Spider Woman. Yes. History of Violence. Yep. Body heat. Body heat. Broadcast news. And broadcast news. Quick and easy this week, fellas. <laughs> oh. Good job. Yeah, they all took place in like the same five-year span. 80 to 85. <laughs> <laughs> Children of a Lesser God should be on here for sure. That movie's great. My man, just like Angelica, did some good work in the 80s. That is for sure. We're going to get into the months and meter the way this works. If you're a first-time listener, we rate every actor on a score of 0 to 100 based on a variety of factors. Those factors could include longevity, project choice, pop culture impact, their range as an actor, awards footprint, any other talents they might have, personal life, comedic chops, box office success or lack thereof, and anything else that matters to each one of us. We're going to start with Case this week. I really wanted to like William Hurt because of a lot of the work that he's done. And I, I just I find a lot of those movies enjoyable. And I think he's a really good actor in... Like a lot of the other really good performers we have, I appreciate the fact he strives to be a character actor. I don't know why I like that about the different performers we have, but those that are trying to be a character actor rather than just a movie star tend to strike a chord with me. On the other side of that, there are some things that make it tough to like him. He seems very, very difficult in interviews. As James said, he's notorious for being kind of a prick on, on the set, which to me 
if that's who he really is, actually makes his acting more impressive because you don't really get that in any of the roles he plays, unless that is what the role is calling for. He's had a lot of toxic relationship and chemical abuse issues. It seems like he went from one toxic relationship and situation to another until he finally said the hell with it, moved to France, started a family. Since then, doesn't appear to have a lot of issues. Uh, however, being that I don't think he really gives a shit one way or another, uh, okay. if I take off points about his personal side, uh, I do think his body of work will balance that out, including his award recognition. So I'm going to give him a 73. All right, Warren. I was a bit surprised with the awards. You know, I, I recognize that he's in movies that received awards. Do I mean, would I put them anywhere in like the pantheon of movies that I think deserve awards? No, but that was just the time. I struggle with going back and watching older movies and saying like, oh, this is what it would have been like watching this movie in the early 80s. Yeah. Like, I've got no clue mm-hmm. what that's like. Yeah. And so I, I struggle with that, which is why I like going back. I, I really wish I had seen like Alter States. Uh, just because it, it's very different from everything else that he had done. But taking the acting and, you know, his his personal life. So, like, I, I come to realize that I don't really take the personal life into account. Um, I mean, and if I really would, it, it's really hard to uh, say, like, oh, I'm going to deduct two points because he you know, raped and physically <laughs> assaulted somebody. So if I was going to take it into account, the guy would get a zero because it's a piece of shit move. We do not condone any of that stuff. We're a firm podcast uh, against those things. <laughs> His movies, in my opinion, he kind of plays the same person in, in most of the movies that I have seen. Maybe that just means the ones that I haven't seen are his better ones because my taste in the movies suck. Before doing this, I don't think I could have pointed out who J- uh, John Hurt was. No, I'm kidding. Will, uh, Bill Hurt. Um, we could absolutely point out John Willie. Hurt. Willie. all that porn you want. <laughs> Do not go type in John Hurt porn because it doesn't all, all that does is come up with bad BDSM stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like that. I don't think the name recognition is really there for anybody who's like 35 and younger mm-hmm. because you didn't really grow up with them. Full agree. Unless you were like, hey, I remember him from Lost in Space. He does have a very interesting arc and all that stuff. But bottom line, not one of my favorites. He's going to get a 65 from me. All right, Mark. We mentioned the the personal issues that he's gone through. I would say that if he if he didn't have that sort of as a knock against him, I would give him my highest score because I think he's a hell of an actor. Even if it was in the 80s, he's got the awards chops to prove it. And Body Heat and History of Violence are two of my favorite movies. So he would get the highest score if he didn't sort of have a shady personal life to to go with it, unfortunately. So I'm going to give him a 79. The other Rigby, John. This was hard. I, I struggled with the, is it better to burn out than it is to fade away question because I think he obviously... Mm just absolutely brought the heat in the eighties and is a part of some pretty classic films, including some of my favorites, you know, even though he had a pretty yawning gap in in the nineties and and two thousands, there are some performances in that period that are still memorable, like history of violence, like we talked about. So I'm going to go with 75 Okay, from my end. So it's kind of a weird experience with William Hurt. I enjoyed the process. I enjoyed closing some gaps of movies that I had heard about and never seen before and seeing him in some of these projects over the year. While I was also, similar to Warren, kind of bored by a lot of his roles because I'm used to watching actors who have more dynamic approaches to the characters that they play and everything felt pretty repetitive in certain ways. So I struggled with that a little bit. I know I've likened his career to Angelica Houston in a lot of ways. I think it's a pretty spot on analogy. Back to back rose to prominence in the 80s, have done some decent things over the years, but never really regained that prominence they once had. But when I look across the board, pop culture impact isn't there. You know, I think Warren was spot on by saying anybody less than 35 years old, unless they're a huge movie buff, are not going to know who William Hurt is. Yep. Um, yeah. Very rarely. And I think that hurts him because that's a lot of our listening audience and, and folks that pay attention to what we do here. I gave him like a one out of 10 for personal life just because he's got f- four children across three baby mamas. So he's got all the baby mama drama you would want in the world. And as we talked about, his abuse, physical alcohol. Um, drug abuse and beating up the deaf chick. Not a great look on that front. And he's not a very funny guy either, so he didn't really get any points there for me. So taking that all into account, successful theater and film careers, 
while being kind of a polarizing figure and a really tough person to interview, I'm going to give him a 71. James, round us out. I'll go quick. You guys mentioned it. He acted in five movies that have been nominated for Best Pictures in the 80s. Uh, he's been nominated for four Academy Awards, three of them in a row. He won an Academy Award, and then his life kind of fell apart. I agree. The pop culture impact, not there. Didn't know who he was until you mentioned. I was like, oh, yeah, that's the dude from Incredible Hulk. I thought Altered State was awesome. Absolutely deserved the hype that it got. But Kyle, you just mentioned it. Dude's not funny at all. And his personal life needs to be taken into account. And when you're accused of something so horrific, your initial response should be to deny it. And he went with, we've all moved on. And I'm sorry, but that is just <laughs> not an acceptable answer for what he's been accused of. Uh, so all things considered, I put him at a 64. All right, Warren, what do we got? I put Slick Willie Hurt at a 71.17, which is 16th, which has him between Chris Pratt and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. So fair. Craig, didn't you say his star meter was like 16th or something on the front end? On our average rankings of star meter, critic ranking, fan ranking, box office performance, he is 16th out of 30. Damn. Look at that. Jesus. We're good at what we do, guys. Took a year, but we're finally here. It's a science by now. <laughs> we all balance each other out really well. <laughs> Took us a turn of the year to figure it out. All right, cool. When William Hurt does, does pass away, sadly, on his tombstone, it's going to say... Three-year consecutive award winner, sandwiched in between Chris Pratt and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. <laughs> Joseph Gordon-Levitt. <laughs> <laughs> Real shit sandwich there. All right, Warren, what's he got coming soon? So he's got five things coming up. One of them, which is Black Widow. He's got a movie called The King's Daughter, which is kind of like a Little Mermaid thing. So that'll be great with him and Pierce Brosnan. Uh, a movie called The Fence, which caught my caught my eye. It is, just listen to this synopsis, uh, right now it's cast as Shailene Woodley, Miles Teller, and William Hurt. Uh, a pair of liberal newlyweds find themselves at odds with the ultra-conservative neighbor over a nine-foot-tall fence he insists on building to keep his home safe from potential terrorists. <laughs> that sounds uh, delightful. It is classified <laughs> as a drama. Sounds like the Brian Cranston episode of King of Queens. I like it. I was about to say, Shailene Woodley is not going to be acting. That's like her personal life right there. Yeah. Yeah, now that she's got Aaron Rodgers, right? That's true. That, and there's two other movies. One's called Men of Granite, which is basically like, it's a basketball movie with kids from uh, Illinois, 1940 state championship. So it's like Glory Road and all those other movies. And another one called the pair or Edward Enderby. Some uh, it's a World War II, a heartbreaking story of friendship, love, and loss. Lifetime movie. Yeah, some shit like that. <laughs> He's still making stuff. Whether or not it's any good, that's to be determined. He's busier than Angelica mm -hmm. at this point in his career. We can't all be signed on to be a <laughs> mute poodle in the next uh, <laughs> in the next Wes Anderson. Wes Anderson movie. movie. I mean, if only we could be so lucky. Right, Warren? That was what I wanted to be. My uh, my Twitter avatar was find the mute <laughs> poodle. The, the poodle. <laughs> but I couldn't, I couldn't find it. Five actors were thrown on the wheel for the next episode. We've got Terrence Howard, Elizabeth Shue, Dan Fogler, Keith David, and Paul Walter Hauser. What do we love? What do we hate? I'd like to do Paul Walter Hauser just because he's pretty current. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say Paul Walter Hauser has been yeah. awesome recently. Keith David's very funny. Good voice actor. I can't think of one movie that Dan Fogler is in. Balls of Fury. Take Me Home Tonight. Take Me Home Tonight. That's the first yeah, one. Yeah, Balls and of Fury is the only one I could think of. And I'm like, great, can't wait to watch that. Good luck, Chuck. He's in the Harry Potter prequels, The Crimes of Grindelwald and all that stuff. Terrence Howard wouldn't be bad. He's had a weird career, but he, he was in some good stuff in the, in the in his early part of his career. They kind of disappeared, and then... The last movie I remember him being in is Prisoners. I can't think of anything else. But Prisoners was great. Yeah. He's not in the Marvel movies anymore. No. Yeah, I'd love to do Keith David. Somebody would have to talk about or review They Live, and that would give me so much pleasure to be able to talk about that movie publicly. Ah. Rowdy Rowdy Piper. I love They Live, Craig. That's a great movie. Oh, it's great. Best fight scenes of, in movie history. It's like a 20-minute long scene where they just punch the shit out of each other and 
downtown Los Angeles. And we, and we got great. a chance to talk about Armageddon. Yep. Elizabeth Shue, uh, somebody we get to watch Hollow Man. So that's, that's what I was just going to say, man. Love Someone's going to watch man. Bacon and Hollow Man. Her and the boys season one. Oh, she's in the boys. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's like oh, the CEO. Right. Leaving Las Vegas is good, too, with her in it. That's true. Award winner, right? She was nominated for that role. It's a good list. It's a good list, minus Dan Fogler. John, who would you pick? The name that I that first jumped out to me was 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 Keith David. How'd you get about the Frank? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say he's, <laughs> he's hilarious in in pretty much every comedic role that that he's Green. cast in. But also he has like a ton of heft as like a, a documentary narrator. Really, mm. that's a performance art in its own right. So that's kind of yeah. I would like to see some consideration there. The world knows John Ruby doesn't select um, the wheel decides, and we'll the just kind of let. Not John Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> he won Margot Martin. I was say, John, John you, you passed on a golden opportunity to, to say, uh, well, I would pick Margot Martin Bale, but of the five <laughs> options you have here, you know, I'd, I'd pick Keith David. Well, John, it was fantastic to have you again. Um, we Thanks, appreciate you being here, my friend. Yep. This was great. I appreciate it. Thanks for jumping on again, buddy. Thanks, John. Yep. So, John, do you have any outgoing plugs, words of wisdom for audience? Go back and watch Body Heat. And if, you, if you're going to associate yourself with the big chill, do it with the soundtrack and not the movie. <laughs> Music's a lot better than the movie. Oh, okay. Amen. All right, well, our next podcast is going to land on March 11th. Our guest is going to be Cam Sully of the Jacked Up Review Show podcast. He's a lot of fun. Guy's got a ton of knowledge, so we'll bring him on and as another guest, Munson, and kind of see where we go. As always, you can find us on Twitter at Munson's at Movies. You can find us on Instagram, Munson's at the Movies. You can email us, Munson's at the Movies at gmail.com. Any final thoughts from Munson's? You got some nerve. I'll give you that. You're a talent for horse shit. Rivals mine. You the world's on fire. And you think all is forgiven? Munson's out. All right, let's go. Thank you for the education, gentlemen. We've just received a PhD in stupidity. Doctor, shall we?